of acre now, it's not really for, it's putting on the weekend for allowing us to, to sponsor a, uh, to sponsor an event today. Part of the reason that this weekend's activities is mainly, one of the reasons it's being held now, the timing, is of course because the Supreme Court handed down a big uh, case this summer. And so we have a speaker that's going to come out and, and talk uh, a little bit about it. And to introduce our speaker, I'm going to hand over to Lindsay Zuslack, senior educator, to uh, get started. Hi, everyone. Um, so, Jonathan Adler is the inaugural Johan. Johan Garo, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Memorial Professor of Law and Director of the Center of Business, Law and Regulation at the University, um, uh, excuse me, at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law. There he teaches courses in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law. John Adler has contributed to a wide range of legal scholarships. He is the author and editor of five books and numerous book chapters. He has testified before Congress numerous times and his work has been cited in the U.S. Supreme Court. Adler is a regular contributor to the popular legal blog, The Bull Up Conspiracy, hosted by WashingtonPost.com. He is a regular commentator and on, he's a regular commentator on constitutional and regulatory issues. He has appeared on numerous radio and television programs. Prior to joining the faculty at the Case Western Reserve, Adler worked with the Honorable David B. Suntel on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And from 1991 to 2000, Adler worked at the Competitive Enterprise um, Institute, a free market research and advocacy group in Washington, D.C. He received his undergraduate degree from Yale University and went on to George Mason um, University School of Law. Please help me, enter, please help me welcome Jonathan Adler. And I'm, I'm glad I teach big lectures, so I'm usually that. If you can't hear me in the back, let me know. More importantly, I start speaking too fast. Just kind of made it all. I'll <laughs> I sometimes I sometimes build up some momentum and really get going. But thank you. It's it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, to talk about uh, an issue that is obviously very important, and to talk about an important Supreme Court decision. And it's a pleasure to, to be here as part of uh, this weekend's activities. Obergefell versus Hodges was, in many respects, the capstone to a quite remarkable Supreme Court term, a term that in many ways defied expectations, that did not act, or at least the court did not act the way we often come to expect the Roberts Court to act. Though in one way, and in some respects in this case, it actually gave us much of what we expected. As you all know, just over three months ago, on June 26th, a date which for a number of reasons is increasingly important uh, in, in marking progress towards gay and lesbian equality in this country, the Supreme Court declared that the Constitution guarantees same-sex couples the right to enter into marriage recognized by the state. And those of you who don't know, June 26th is also the date in 2003, the Supreme Court invalidated Texas sodomy law. Uh, and it was also the date in 2013 that the Supreme Court invalidated the Federal Defense Marriage Act. Uh, so June, uh, and do not, I do not believe there's any accident that Obergefell was handed down on June 26th as well. Under Obergefell, there is no distinction anymore between same-sex marriage and what we may call traditional or opposite-sex marriage. There is just marriage in which any couple may enter regardless of their sex. The court reached this judgment five to four, a decision authored by Justice Kennedy, who also authored the opinions of Lawrence and Windsor. And these opinions share a lot of uh, the same characteristics in their style, uh, the authorities which they appeal, and their approach to doctrine. There were also four dissents in the court, one for each of the dissenting justices. It's perhaps interesting to note that this case proves five opinions by the five justices that were nominated by Republican presidents, and five opinions that represented I think, some fairly distinct views of the question presented and the proper approach of the Supreme Court to this sort of issue. Now, this decision was a long time to come. The first time the Supreme Court had been asked to enter in or to weigh in on the question of same-sex marriage was actually in 1972 in a case called Baker versus Nelson. Uh, in that case, the court summarily dismissed the appeal on the grounds that there was no significant federal question to be answered. Now, in 1972, homosexuality was still considered to be a psychological disorder. 
And in most of the United States, consenting homosexual activities were still criminal. The idea of same-sex marriage was a fringe idea. When I was a college student in the 1980s, the idea of gay marriage still seemed like something of an outlandish, uh, an outlandish thought, uh, even in the gay and lesbian community. Andrew Sullivan, who some of you may be familiar with, wrote a very influential cover story for the New Republic in the late 1980s. Uh, and he was attacked from both the left and the right for his heresy. The right for suggesting that marriage could be something other than between a man and a woman, the left for his capitulation to heterosexist bourgeois norms and institutions like marriage, which were unnecessarily oppressive. It was seen as an interesting thought piece, not as something that actually predicted or had much to say about what would be political reality. It's fair to say a lot has changed since then. A lot has even just changed in the last 10 years. In 2004, as I'm sure many of you know, Ohio was one of many states that enacted ballot measures enshrining the definition of marriage between one man and one woman into the state constitution. In Ohio, that vote prevailed by, with 62% of the electorate. So nearly two-thirds of Ohioans in, two, in just over a decade voted to prevent recognition of same-sex marriage and, and sought to constitutionalize it in part so as to prevent the possibility that state court judges might decide that there was a right to same-sex marriage under state law. And Ohio was not alone. Uh, at that time, nationwide polls similarly found that uh, opposition to same-sex marriage. Same-sex unions either identified as marriage or as civil unions were typically only recognized in a handful of municipalities at that point in time, uh, and certainly in, under laws that were enacted by popular support. That same year, uh, noted law professor Cass Sunstein, who at the time was at the University of Chicago, and is now at Harvard, who testified before Congress that, quote, it is possible that the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Cubs will meet the World Series and play, a seven, play to a seventh game top. That is unlikely, but that scenario is more likely than it is that the Supreme Court of the United States, as currently constituted, will hold that there is a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. This is a reckless conception of what is on the horizon, and it is indefensible by reference to anything any Supreme Court justice has said, at least on the bench, and I believe even off the Five of the justices currently on the court were sitting on the court in 2004, including three of the justices that were in the majority, including Justice Kennedy, who wrote the majority. It's fair to say the Cubs perhaps have come a long way since 2004, but same-sex marriage in the courts has, has gone a little farther. By 2014, by last year, nationwide polls found that a clear majority of Americans supported state recognition of same-sex marriage, and it even pulled ahead or at least to even depending on the polls you look at, even or ahead in Ohio, which just 10 years earlier had voted at 62 to 38 to prohibit same sex marriage. In 2009, legislators in Vermont, New Hampshire, and the District of Columbia had all embraced same sex marriage. New York did so in 2011. Maine did so in 2012 by referendum. By the time Obergefell reached the Supreme Court, same sex marriage had been approved either by, by legislatures or by popular referendum in 11 states in the District of Columbia. State Supreme Courts have held that same-sex marriage and its equivalent must be recognized in five additional states. And by the time the court was held, federal courts had required the recognition of same-sex marriage in 20 more states. Things had also changed at the federal level. In 2013, in another 5-4 decision written by Justice Kennedy, the Supreme Court had struck down the federal defense of marriage. Now, in that case, the issues were somewhat different because part of the question was whether the federal government had any business defining or regulating marriage. Uh, and it was interesting that I was uh, signed on to a brief uh, in that case arguing that the Defense of Marriage Act was not something that could be justified under the federal government's limited and enumerated powers. That is to say, the federal government's powers to regulate commerce and to create a uniform law of bankruptcy and the like did not allow it to define marriage for all purposes. Uh, and uh, the court seemed to embrace uh, that position. Requiring states to recognize same-sex marriage was the next logical step, and certainly one that was anticipated uh, that would follow eventually after the decision in Windsor. Indeed, after the first several federal courts had 
held that state laws barring recognition of same-sex marriage were invalid, the Supreme Court took what many thought was the unusual step of declining to hear those cases. Unusual because many thought this was a high-profile enough issue that the court would necessarily intervene, and perhaps out of recognition that uh, were the court not to intervene, same-sex marriage in those jurisdictions would be free to come plea, whatever the court would eventually hold on its constitutional necessity. The Supreme Court did not accept the case concerning same-sex marriage until the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and a series of cases, including one that came from Ohio, uh, held that state law both refusing to uh, license a same-sex marriage as well as refusing to recognize a same-sex marriage performed elsewhere uh, was, if on, even if unwise, constitutional. Now, in terms of the idea that the law should embrace same-sex marriage, the general idea that the law should reflect the expectations and norms of those who live under it is something that has long been part of our legal tradition. When you go to law school, you, when you study what we refer to as the common law courses, one of the things you will see is a history of courts trying to anticipate and understand what are the rules and norms that people are trying to live under. When two parties enter into a contract, they aren't going to have accounted for every possible contingency that might arise, and courts try to figure out, well, what would the parties have expected or wanted had they anticipated this, had they understood this? They need the law providing a background against which individuals can arrange and order their private affairs without undue interference. And from that standard, one looks at what's occurred in society over the last 20 years, there would seem to be little reason to differentiate between opposite and same-sex marriage. Same-sex couples, whether recognized by the state or not, are present throughout American life. They're no longer confined to the shadows and edges of society. Icons of pop in popular culture who in prior years would have hid their sexuality and hid their relationships are quite open about it and are celebrated on the covers of magazines and on television shows. And with familiarity with the fact that homosexuals were not the other, but our neighbors, our relatives, our friends, the idea that homosexuals should live under the same rules as the rest of us became something that more and more Americans, logically and understandably, became comfortable with. And many pawns of gay marriage who raised the quite the specter, or raised the issue of what about the children? There's an argument that uh, has a long-standing basis in American law and tradition that the purpose of marriage was not initially to provide for adult fulfillment, was not necessarily to, union, to, to provide a union between two soulmates, but was rather to provide an institutional structure of some rigidity that would provide for a nest, an environment that was particularly conducive to raising children and inculcating values. And certainly, if one looks at American law, and Justice Kennedy's opinion of Virgil acknowledges that you see throughout the Supreme Court's decisions over the years concerning marriage that this was an implicit understanding through much of the Western legal tradition. And that even uh, societies uh, in, in, in prior centuries that in which there was not significant antipathy or animus against homosexuals still saw marriage as having this conjugal notion, this notion of having something to do with children apart from an adult relationship. But it's interesting if one thinks about the way we actually live, this argument as a policy matter loses some force. Already 40% of children are born outside of wedlock. So whether living, being born into and raised by a set of two parents is better than alternatives, it is not how many children are raised. Millions are raised in single parent households at best. And it seems that we see that reducing the number of single parent households would not be in the interest of the children. Indeed, even before the Supreme Court's decision on Obergefell, as a practical matter, virtually every state already allowed gay parents to raise children. Nearly all of that allow gay individuals to adopt and to serve as foster parents. So whatever one thinks about the, the historical notion of marriage as a conjugal entity, the way we live now 
is not based on viewing childbearing that way or marriage. Hundreds of thousands of children, whether the Supreme Court had decided the way it did or not, would be raised by the parents. And even if one believes that raising a child in a quote unquote traditional home with their biological mother and their biological father is the gold standard or the ideal all else equal, it's hard to argue that children would be better off being raised in a household with neither of their biological parents or shuttled from foster home to foster home through the foster care system or raised by a single parent household because the state would refuse to recognize a two parent union. If two are better than one, even if purely on economic terms, because there are more hands to share in the labor, more individuals to, to deal with children, in the case of families with more than two children, more people to play zone defense, um, it's hard to argue that consigning hundreds of thousands of children into households of a single parent that was not chosen to be a, that would not have chosen to be a single parent is somehow in the interests of children. And if part of the purpose of marriage is to enhance the solidity and, and the, the longevity of a bond, to provide stability, to keep two people together for a longer period of time than they've been together otherwise, and that that, provi and that provides a more stable household, a more stable environment in which to raise children, it would seem allowing more couples to have that <coughs> institutional protection, that reinforcement of the relationship would, in fact, be in the benefit of children. A friend of mine, Bill Carpenter, has noted from a, a fairly conservative Burkean notion of looking at the way we live, the traditions we actually embody in our actions, it would be hard to argue that preventing gay couples from solemnizing their relationships and getting the institutional benefits of state recognition would in any way serve the goals of protecting children that are raised in the context of marriage. So even from uh, fairly conservative premises about what the nature of, mar of marriage is in the institution, what its role is, and why we want the state to be involved in it at all, you know, there, is, there is a separate question about whether or not the state should be the entity that decides who can or, can, can or cannot be married in the first place, but assuming that the state is taking that role, there is clearly a strong argument to be made in favor of recognizing and reinforcing the relationships which we see throughout society that are capable of providing more stable and more secure environments in which to raise children. I think it's also true that as more Americans begin to realize the case of lesbians are all around them and face the same trials and tribulations as everyone else, that they are moved to consider how the failure to recognize same-sex marriage affects the way people, or affects things that, that many people take for granted. And there's probably no better example of this than the case of the main plaintiff in the world called James O'Brien. James O'Brien and his partner, John Arthur, have been together for about 20 years but without the benefit of a state-sanctioned marriage, but clearly they were in a long-term committed relationship of the sort that, that one we usually consider to be worthy of, of marriage. So in order to develop ALS, and they wanted to be married before John Arthur died. So what they ended up doing was um, they flew to Maryland, and when John Arthur was pretty much on his deathbed, they got married on the time of the year. And they flew back. And James Bergfeld wanted a copy of his father's death certificate. And was denied. Because he said, well, how did not recognize his marriage? He not recognize their marriage. It was performed in another state. Ohio's rule was same-sex marriage was against the public policy of Ohio. And so despite the full faith of their clause, would not be recognized. Now, whatever one's view of same-sex marriage is in the abstract, whatever one thinks the, 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 the ideal would be, it's hard to look at a case like this and, and see that there is any justice or fairness. James O'Brien was not asking for very much. He was asking for something that individuals and couples take for granted. 
the ability to have the answer of this partner. And so as, as story, people became aware of stories like this, and, and you know, we could go through the stories of some of the other things. In this case, we talked about the Windsor, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the Windsor case. We began to realize, I think many Americans began to realize that acceptance of same-sex marriage was not uh, a, a radical notion that it was once viewed as, and in many respects would merely allow other Americans to live their lives in the way that heterosexuals take for granted. And in an age when our primary conception of marriage as we actually live is no longer the conjugal notion of marriage that may have been dominant 50, 100, 200 years ago, it would seem odd to confine this notion of marriage uh, to uh, only two opposite sex partners. Marriage is clearly, by many people, no longer seen as a bond that must be eternal. You're no longer seen as a bond that's primarily about child rearing. Uh, it is about other things, romantic love, adult fulfillment, things that same-sex couples are clearly equally capable of fulfilling. And as I already know, that there are questions to raise. There are questions to raise about even assuming the conjugal notion of marriage, whether or not uh, the value of same-sex unions has been. Underestimated or underappreciated. But the second, second question I want to address, and, and, and an additional question I want to address, is the question of whether or not the strong policy, the credential arguments for recognizing same sex marriage, or how they should inform our view of what the Constitution requires, and how they should inform our view of the overall decision. Because approval of the practical result of practical policy result in our system does not always necessarily translate into approval of a particular constitutional result. It's long established that one of the freedoms that the Constitution gives us is the freedom of self-government, which in some respects is the freedom to make mistakes, and sometimes to make really bad mistakes. And particularly in the context of what states are allowed to do in our federal system, it is a system that often allows states to make very large mistakes and adopt policies that many of us find wrong-headed, offensive, unfair, or unjust. I should say, as someone that has been a long-time supporter of same-sex marriage, I came away from Andrew Sullivan's presentation uh, when I was an undergrad uh, about this article, thoroughly convinced. I would like to believe that same-sex marriage, state records of same-sex marriage is constitutionally compelled, but I must admit I am something of a skeptic, and I will explain why. When Justice Kennedy's opinion for the court came out, I wanted it to be convincing, and I wanted it to be doctrinally satisfying. I had to teach it to my students next week, and I had to help them try and help them understand how it fits against the background of the relevant legal doctrines that have reached this point. And it will be an interesting class. There's much to admire in Justice Kennedy's opinion as a statement of policy and aspiration. There's language in that opinion that is lyrical and that I think is moved, quite moving. But as even noted seems like American opponent William Eskridge, the Yale Law School has noted it reads in many respects like a policy. It gives really good, really powerful arguments why we should all want to live in a world in which same-sex marriage is recognized by the state on equal terms of opposite sex As a professor, I can't help looking at it a little bit like an exam answer. When I give my students, when I give my students exams and I give them hypotheticals, I give some hypothetical about you know, some constitutional conflict that could arise. And what do I want them to do? Well, I want them to identify the issue. I want them to identify it crisply and cleanly so that they can identify the relevant legal rule. I want them to define that rule. I want them to explain that rule. I want them, and then I want them to apply it in light of how that rule has been applied before in a relatively clear and consistent way. That's what I expect from my students. I, I don't get the grade Justice Kennedy. Um, uh, and um, it's probably a good thing, because if one reads the Alberta Call decision, one could say the same thing about the opinion of Lawrence versus Texas. One doesn't see the sort of structure that one might want from a law student or even in an appellate brief 
that tries to very clearly identify the existing rule based on existing doctrine and apply the rule on the standard texts. Indeed, as other uh, scholars have noted, and, and, and Bill Eskridge perhaps uh, most, uh, most clearly, in interesting ways, Justice Kennedy didn't even appear to try, didn't even try to take what might have been the clearest and cleanest doctrinal path toward reaching the result of declaring that same-sex marriage must be recognized on equal terms with opposite-sex marriage. The easiest way to reach this result would have been under a doctrine that referred to as equal protection. The idea that when the, that like classes must be treated alike. That if the government is going to divide some classes and treat us differently, there must be a relevant difference. And when classifications are based on certain criteria, I mean, there is long-standing doctrine that courts should be suspicious. The most obvious example being race. When government uses race, we apply something called strict scrutiny. Because of our history, we know that when the government relies upon race, we better be careful because there is a long history of the government using race in ways that are precious. Gender-based or sex-based classifications also receive a form of heightened scrutiny, usually referred to as intermediate scrutiny, not quite as rigorous as, as is applied in the context of race, but still fairly demanding. Still fairly suspicious that sex-based classifications or gender-based classifications are based on stereotypes, are based on uh, outmoded notions about inherent differences between the sexes that might be uh, uh, more the result of cultural norms than they are and meaningful differences that the state should be aware of. And in the context of same sex marriage, there's an easy way to get to that point. The legality of the union is to, in, in a state barring recognition of same sex marriage is dependent upon the sex of the participants. It is, in many meaningful respects, a sex-based classification. So we have Ohio Cardinal Obergefell. If you want, if you were a man who wanted to marry a woman, it is legal. If you were a man that wanted to marry a man, it would not be. Now, the court had gone this way. It still would have faced some obstacles, uh, including uh, some opinions actually written by Justice Kennedy, in which the court had said that genuine biological differences, including those related to childbirth, are things that the state may pay attention to. So there's a very controversial opinion Justice Kennedy wrote several years ago involving immigration law, uh, in, which, in which the court upheld the provision of immigration law and simplified, that says that uh, basically makes it much easier for a child born out of wedlock to a citizen mother but non citizen father. It's much easier for that child to become a US citizen than for the child of the citizen father but non citizen mother. And Justice Kennedy upheld that not merely based on concerns about being able to prove parentage, but also assumptions about the bond between parent and child that at least had the potential to result uh, from the fact that the mother would be the present at child's birth and the father might not. But despite that opinion, certainly there certainly was ample would have been ample basis to treat laws bar recognition of same-sex marriage as something that should be subject to heightened scrutiny treat them as sex-based classifications, and to raise serious questions about the various rationales that Ohio and other states sought to offer defending those laws. That's not the path the court took. Another way to rely upon equal protection would have been to challenge the exclusion of same-sex couples from the institution of marriage, and to question whether the maintenance of tr the traditional justification for marriage or traditional definition of marriage embodied some form of that. There's a, long, there's a long line of cases involving a wide range of classifications that basically says states have a, long, a wide leeway in drawing classifications along, across a wide range of characteristics, provided that they're not based on some form of animus, some sort of distaste or of the other or concern about lack of familiarity. And it, it, we have seen this in cases not only involving sexual preference, but cases involving mental disability, case my students tend to like involving hippies. Congress wanted to deny welfare benefits to hippies living in communal homes. And some members of Congress on the floor of Congress said, yeah, we don't want this money going to hippies. And the court said, you know, it's not a good reason to come <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, You can tell people about family structure or something, but you can't just stay here again. And certainly, 
one looks at the pattern of, of, of uh, laws and measures enacted both at the state level and through referendum to reinforce um, the traditional definition of marriage, things like the enactment of Proposition in California, the like state uh, initiative here in Ohio, there's at least a plausible argument to be made that, that conception of homosexuals of the other or some form of animus was a part of, of that and that that would, should require some greater degree of attention to the court of the classification. And particularly you know, at, a time, at a time, as I've already mentioned, in which whatever states say about the conjugal notion of marriage, um, existing law and existing practice don't embody no fault divorce uh, and the like are not the sorts of laws one would expect from states that really had this old-fashioned uh, notion of, of conjugal marriage. And so there could have been a case made that uh, state refusal to um, recognize same-sex marriage uh, was based at least in part on, this, uh, on some form of animus and that therefore uh, was problematic with equal protection. Uh, and while there are some hints of that in the court's opinion, Justice Kennedy doesn't really take that regard. Now, I should note that as a, as a doctrinal matter, the court would still have had some work to do. The, the court's prior marriage decisions, that, as Justice Kennedy acknowledged in his opinion, uh, fairly expressly uh, embodied and, and, and uh, entailed or, or assumed a, a consumption or a, an understanding of marriage that was based upon marriage as, an, as a, a union with procreative potential. Uh, and uh, there were not prior cases that asked the court to question what the definition of marriage was as opposed to its applicability or who could participate in it. Um, but those, are, those would have been well, you know, as with, with treating the refusal to recognize same-sex marriage as a permissible sex-based classification, these would have been, I think, relatively small doctrinal uh, hurdles, hurdles that the court could have, uh, could have overcome. And I, and I think one looks at the academic commentary on Rodefell. These are the roots that most academic commentators, most uh, uh, academics who submitted amicus briefs in the case had asked the court to take. Uh, but that's not what the court did. While not in equal protection principles, it rested its conclusion primarily on the notion of due process, the notion that the constitutional guarantee that the government may not deny individuals of liberty without due process of law has a substantive component that bars the adoption and enforcement of arbitrary infringements on individual liberty. In this respect, the Bergefell opinion was very much a Justice Kennedy opinion because he writes, he has written many opinions along these lines and not merely in the context of sexual education. As he opened his opinion, the Constitution promises liberty to all of us, to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. The premise of this argument, according to Justice Kennedy, that the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. So Justice Kennedy concluded that, quote, the right to marry is a fundamental right inherent in the liberty of the person and that, quote, couples of the same sex may not be deprived of that right and that liberty. Now, some of this spends a lot of time with constitutional law. I think this rationale is very unsatisfying. For one reason, it's unsatisfying because it's using the word liberty to characterize a claim for government recognition and equal provision of government-provided benefits. Liberty traditionally understood and our constitutional system is freedom from restraint. It made sense to invoke this conception of liberty in a case like Lawrence versus Texas, where two individuals were subject to potential criminal prosecution for doing nothing more than engaging in a consensual sexual act in the privacy of one of their homes. That is an infringement upon liberty. Traditionally, when the government is not providing entitlement or providing certain governmental benefits or recognition, we recognize that that may be a violation of protection if not treating folks equally. But historically, we would not have characterized that as a deprivation of liberty. Further, the court has, for quite some time, followed a fairly narrow test for recognizing fundamental rights that are entitled to this type of 
constitutional protection. For decades, the court has held that the Constitution only protects those unenumerated rights that are fairly well grounded in our history and tradition. And that generally means it protects those sorts of things that we hadn't thought about protecting because the government hadn't bothered to interfere with them. That's a difficult case to make when we're talking about instead having the law keep up with changes in society, having the law recognize the way we live now as opposed to the way we lived in the past. And Justice Kennedy's opinion does not barely even acknowledges this traditional test, let alone seek to adopt it. The other thing that I think is, 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 that is doctrinally curious is just two years ago in the Windsor case, the case invalidating the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, the case purporting to, in which the case in which the federal government had claimed the authority to not, as it had traditionally done, accept those marriages that were valid under state law as valid for federal purposes, which is the way the federal government treats contracts, which is the way the federal government treats property rights, which is the way the federal government treats almost everything that is governed by state law, in which the federal government made the, I think, audacious claim that it didn't matter if the marriage was valid under state law. The federal government would impose a definition of its own, and not only in those areas where the federal government might have some particular justification, like immigration law, but across the board. In that opinion, Justice Kennedy noted that we have a long tradition of allowing states to set all sorts of rules in the family law context, including who can and can't get married, under what conditions, when divorces can and cannot be issued, how to deal with child custody, and so on. And we've long recognized that states often will make very large mistakes. And that if people don't like what certain states are doing, that people will vote at the ballot box, and they will vote for their people. Now, certainly the conception that the states have tried to defend is on the wane, and I do not think it would have lasted much longer than whatever the court did under Obergefell, but it would have been nice for the court to at least acknowledge what was a fairly dramatic change in heart about the role of states in defining what constitutes marriage. In Windsor, the court had said one reason to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act was to protect the ability of states to define marriage in, in ways that it, their citizens demanded, even if that meant recognizing same-sex marriage, which had not historically been recognized. That concern for state prerogative, state prerogative to do wrong, was, uh, was uh, not evident. And as a doctrinal matter, it would have been nice for the court to at least address that concern. The Burkeville decision may have been just. I certainly believe it was. But it doesn't mean we can't ask serious constitutional questions about the result it reached and how it reached that result. And I should say this is not just something about Burkeville. It has actually been the case that many landmark decisions have been doctrinally unsatisfying. The most obvious example of that is probably Brown versus Board of Education. In fact, there was even a book published several years ago by a series of professors called What Brown versus Board of Education Should Have Said. And the task those professors took in that book was to only use the materials that were available at the time of the decision, try and write opinions that would be more compelling and more convincing than what the court actually wrote. It's not a criticism of the result the court reached in that but of the language and the argument the court deployed. And there are lots of possible reasons why the court's arguments in Brown might not have been the most compelling. We know, for example, that Chief Justice Warren wanted the court to speak with one voice. And for any of you that are faculty know, when you have a committee of strong-willed, opinionated people that care about details, reaching agreement on the wording of a document can be very difficult. Trust me, the court is often like a faculty member. <laughs> Trying to get nine strong-willed, opinionated folks to agree on a single opinion on a high-profile issue is tough to do. And certainly a lot of academics credit the, the, the uh, sparse nature of the legal reasoning around uh, on that basis. And certainly some have speculated that 
for the justices and the majority of the felt getting the result was more important than getting Justice Kennedy to write the opinion that the other justices would have been happy with. At least one justice who joined the opinion has commented publicly that the Obergefell opinion is not an opinion that she would have written. And part of our job as citizens, as citizens who are the ultimate source of our constitutional authority, the authority the court will, we should, even though the court does things that we like, question what the court does, question how it got there. Because its authority is ultimately derived <coughs> from us. And we want it not only to reach results that we are satisfied with, but we want it to reach those results in ways that we are satisfied with, because in the law, what the court does in one case will have an effect in others. And in the context of same-sex marriage, Obergefell is going to end litigation. Because state family law in particular is rife with, or state laws are rife with provisions that presume that marriages are between a man and a woman, and particularly in the context of questions related to children, what assumptions you make about parentage, what assumptions you make about custody, and so on. The laws were based on what was then allowed and presumed, and the lack of a, of a, a clear, more doctrinal, rigid, or more doctrinally satisfying opinion means that lower courts and state courts are going to have a lot more work to do with figuring out what to do with laws like Ohio's that make assumptions about who is or is not the father uh, based on wedlock, not wedlock, submitting a postcard to the father industry, and so on. Um, those are, are, are questions that would also be dealt with more readily and more easily, perhaps have the court taken a more, uh, a more formalistic approach to the question. In any anyway, event, on June 26, the day the court handed down its decision in Obergefell, a former colleague of mine was scheduled to get married. And the time that he was on the West Coast, so by the time of his ceremony, news of the opinion had had come down. And the officiant at that ceremony was able to say, not only you know, by the power invested in by the state of Washington, but also by the Supreme Court, uh, and I now pronounce you married, and it was certainly a joyous event. Their partnership was already known to the friend and family. It was recognized, in fact, up until that point, if not recognized in law. But now it also had an additional benefit of same sort of state recognition that my marriage controls. There's no question that may be 26 days out. So we should so we may like where the court takes us and we may celebrate the results. But that does not mean we always have to like the path that the court took or wonder whether or not there are other paths that would be more satisfying and produce uh, a more uh, a more solid and more defensible rationale. Judges are not our rulers. The Supreme Court is right because it's fine, but it's not fine because it's always right. So let's be happy with our destination, happy that the law has caught up with the life where we live, but continue to raise questions about the path we took to get there. And thinking about the decision, I, I can't help but think that while our nation has certainly reached or has made substantial progress towards the right place, um, we should consider the paths uh, that have been taken and who has taken. Thank you very much. I'm not going to have any questions until I'm all ready. Thank you. 
uh, should have that, that, that same right too. And I think, so I think doctrinally, yeah, the, the, the court recognized what Obama recognized, which is we, we care about the type of speech, justification for restricting that speech, more than we care about the speaker. And I would just also note that the alternative is one that's unsettled. The oral argument is in the season of the Solicitor General of the United States was asked, does this mean that a book published just before an election that ended with a passage saying vote for and against a candidate uh, could be prohibited from being published because publishers are corporations? And the Solicitor General said yes, that that was the logic of the government's position. And I, I think that's far scarier than the alternative. Can we call for the just a couple of comments. One, I was in, this is just kind of an but I was in Iowa when the Iowa Supreme Court gave the state same gender marriage. And every little town in Iowa, and there are thousands of them, had same sex couples. And the weddings were held in the town park. It was a statewide celebration. It was as much fun as I've ever had. And the other one goes back to a previous rule on that went to the Supreme Court on sodomy, mm -hmm. in which the Supreme Court clearly said, we don't ever, we're embarrassed, and we don't ever want to be in this position again. We have no business in someone's bedroom. So, which so I thought was phenomenal. Well, so the court, I mean, the court had in the 1980s, in a mm -hmm. case called Bauer versus Harvard, a case that should never have been brought, and, and, and apparently the state actually tried to, tried to decline to prosecute, um, had, um, There, there, there are some question about precise facts led to it, but a couple, uh, uh, I think a couple was prosecuted uh, for engaging in consensual sexual acts in the privacy of their bedroom, but the cop in the the house, walking in the hall, the bedroom door was open, it was a bizarre set of events. Um, and the court in 1986 had held that, um, that the law was constitutional because states have the police power to protect them, not, not just health and safety, but also morals. And said that the court, the court said that it was not going to recognize unenumerated rights unless they were clearly documented. Um, and part of that historically was the court was taking an early opportunity to repudiate, but put an end to what had been the Warren Border Court tradition of finding lots of unenumerated rights on lots of different issues. And the majority of the court had, been, was, had clearly been looking for an opportunity to say, no, we're not going to be in the new And that was about what was happening. Um, 2003, Lawrence versus Texas, similar fact pattern came up to the court, and the court um, uh, said that, that, that whatever one thinks of, of, of what state, as far as it's sure should not have any question of sexuality, to criminalize it. And, and I think one of the, one of the things that, that makes a word of all sudden different cases. And most of the cases that we think of as kind of precursors involve criminalizing it. So it's not just a question of does the state recognize or not recognize it. The state's been put in jail. Um, Lawrence was, was at risk of going, going to jail. Um, in Loving versus Virginia, the law that, that invalidated uh, Virginia's anti miscegenation law, or an immigration law, it wasn't really that the state wouldn't recognize it. You went to jail. Um, and so there's, you know, the court in Lawrence, I think, uh, harking back to this idea that, that um, arbitrary criminal punishments uh, are, are, are something that are particularly uh, alien to uh, certain aspects of our constitutional tradition. Um, you know, the Lawrence opinion, like the Obergefell opinion, would be maddening as an opinion. Uh, Dale Harbour, who I mentioned before, and I have two friends of mine who both Academics who both celebrate the Lawrence opinion and have an interesting exchange in which they talk about talk about it as an example about how you kind of like it as a statement of principle about liberty and the right to be left alone and the right to organize your affairs, but um, you know, uh, in terms of trying to find a doctrine, it gets more difficult. And, and I I would talk about this as, as a professor, but it, it's really more important more broadly in our legal system because the Supreme Court hears 60, 70 cases a year. It's asked to hear several things. Um, when it issues a decision, lower courts have to apply that decision. And they're going to be applying that decision in facts that aren't 100% the same. And so what they want is a rule. And they want to, they want to see about how to apply that rule. And it's an advocate. My students, when they're out practicing, they write a brief, they want to be able to say to a court, this is the rule. And this is how the rule will apply. 
And so when the court doesn't give us an opinion that has that kind of structure, it actually makes it harder for everyone else in the legal system to kind of figure out what to do. And so in Lawrence, just like in Puerto Rico, these great passages that are inspirational, uh, but it, it's, it's not always clear how you, how you operationalize that, how you decide what that means uh, about when you're faced with a law that um, uh, adopt certain presumptions about, about who the, the, the father of the child is in the absence of a marriage or the absence of uh, a DNA test. It doesn't mean there's much evidence. Um, uh, and um, you know, lower courts have been left to, to figure that out. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't understand your uh, distinction um, about. Uh, Due process. I mean, if, if you're deprived of the liberty of marrying a person of the same gender, why is not that fit reasonably under due process uh, rubrics, even if it's not a purely traditional definition of liberty? And second, um, are you saying the opinion is based more on policy than on due process, or? Equal parts of both, or uh, what was the sure. I mean, way you describe it? Um, so the, the, the constitutional provisions that the court primarily, the constitutional provision that, that Justice Kennedy's opinion primarily appeals to is the due process clause. Right. The arguments that are given are arguments not based on fine parsing and application or extension of existing due process precedents as much as they are policy arguments about why it would be a just and better thing. Why it would be better for children. Why it would recognize the relationships that people actually have. Why it would make it easier for people to order their carriers the same way. Um, which you don't find a lot of that in the due process decisions. Um, in, in terms of liberty, um, liberty in the due process clause has traditionally been understood as freedom from restraint. Isn't it a restraint to not be able to marry a person of the same gender? Well, it, it, it depends. If, if, if the state is not penalizing people in the sense of putting them in jail, criminalizing their behavior, telling people they can't live together, they can't have whatever uh, uh, ceremony in their own faith tradition uh, that they want to have and live the way they want to, as a practical um, there isn't much in our case law that would suggest there is a liberty violation as opposed to an equal protection violation, a failure to treat two couples that in all in all ways that are relevant to the state are the same. Right? And, one, and, if, and, if we, and given the way marriage is generally thought of today, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to argue that there is a relevant distinction between an opposite sex couple and a same sex couple that is relevant to, to, to the state. It's the distinction between that sort of argument and the argument about due process violation be a, a, a physical or other sort of restraint, a threat of, of punishment um, as opposed to the withholding of benefits. So for example, um, uh, in cases involving, for example, um, uh, differential treatment of, of, of people with regard to who can become a citizen with equal protection cases, yes, it's a lot easier to do certain things if you're recognized as a citizen, but those are typically seen as not a liberty interest because it's the it's the bestowing of, of government recognition and, and things that you are entitled to that come with that as opposed to a restraint on the person. And you know there's there, you know, Justice Kennedy I think um, would would we're here to say that he doesn't like that distinction and doesn't think that the doctrine perhaps should embody that distinction. Um, but but I think if, if we actually look at the, the case law as it's developed that distinction is there, and it, and it does have some roots in some of the locking notions of liberty that, that you know, underpin the, the constitutional structure. Um, that doesn't mean that philosophically it's the most appealing conception, but, but in terms of our case law, I think it's a, a good way to see it. So you have to view and expanding the traditional notion of what is restrained? Yes, I, I do, and, and I think, um, you know, there's language in, in this opinion, in Lawrence's opinion, in a portion of the opinion of Casey, which is an abortion decision um, uh, that Justice Kennedy wrote part of the controlling opinion, language in uh, Windsor opinion, 
um, his own opinion, I'm forgetting, where Justice Kennedy, a bunch of these opinions, has articulated this notion that there is an underlying notion of liberty that is about being able to kind of live one's life in, in accord with one's own value, one's own sense. And, um, you know, it's, 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 you find it in Justice Kennedy, but you don't find it in a lot of other places. The, the Chief Justice in his dissent suggested that you find it in, 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 in some cases from the early 20th century, like Blackman and so on. I'm not sure that's fair to Kennedy. Um, uh, Lochner. Um, I mean, yeah, so, so Justice, Chief Justice dissent is basically, in the early 20th century, we recognized liberty the contract with liberty. That's just like this, and it's back then, it's back now. I'm not sure that's fair either, just what I think Justice Kennedy might be trying to do, nor do I think it's fair to actually the early 20th century courts, which, in addition to the, the cases of Lochner, which involved in Maxim Howard and the Bakers, there were cases involving the parents' ability to control what, what languages their children were taught, where their children went to school. And there's actually, there actually are some cases from that period of time that um, do seem to embody uh, a broader presumption of liberty than, um, than modern doctrine that recognize. And, and it's, it's certainly possible that Kennedy, at some level, is trying to restore that notion that, that, that there is just this there should be background constitutional protection against arbitrary governmental action. And failure to regulate same sex marriage is just sufficiently arbitrary in the two similar ways that, that the court shouldn't, shouldn't bless it or, 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 or defend it. Um, but he doesn't quite put it in those terms. So we're still at the point of trying to say this is what it looks like he might be doing. Um, but if that's, if that's what he's trying to do, we'll have to see. You want to clarify substantive due process versus procedural Right, so procedural due process is the process to which you were doing. The idea being that before the government can take something from you and tell you what to do, there are certain procedures it must go through that, that we generally take our, take up as signs that the process was fair and just. So the criminal process that we've been involved in like a jury trial, in like uh, a case of a welfare benefits, it's the government having to done enough so that we know you wouldn't be ar uh, arbitrarily private. I hope substantive due pro process is, is the notion that whatever process was used, there are certain substantive results that are so arbitrary or unjust that they cannot be tolerated. And that's a controversial part of constitutional law, and, and certainly the dissenters in this case are not comfortable with substantive due process generally, let alone here. So, so, I mean, the, 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 the innovation, I guess, in, in classification of liberty interest is classifying liberty interest as, as entailing the right to government recognition or, 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 or government conferred benefits that are obviously very valuable and, and very useful. Um, and, um, and I should say, it's certainly true that some of the things that result or that, or that um, result from the state's decision to recognize or not recognize same-sex marriage could independently be seen as liberty interests. Um, the question is whether or not the classification of marriage itself is. And Justice Kennedy said that was. In prior cases, um, in the case of Lawrence, liberty interest was to be able to engage in, in consensual sexual activity without risking going to jail. Uh, generally, doing anything, you know, anytime you, you do something that could risk going to jail, there is a liberty interest. And the question is, does the government have a justification for that? Um, so it's traditionally been, been, been seen as a freedom from restraint, and it's traditionally been applied to invalidate laws that criminalize conduct. So the criminalization of the use of contraception in this law, the criminalization of obtaining or, or providing abortion in Rome, the criminalization of consensual sexual conduct in Lawrence. It was typically, typically seen of as the interest that is raised as against a, a state sanctioned punishment as opposed to um, uh, 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 a, a statement In your opinion, do you consider any of the dissenting opinions of the government that needs to have more doctrinal 
Yeah, there are the concurrent opinions, which is just interesting, that there are four dissents. I mean, there are parts of the dissents, some of the dissents that I'm sympathetic to. Uh, you know, Justice Thomas does talk about the traditional notion of liberty of the Now, Justice Thomas also thinks that you know, 14th Amendment jurisprudence has you know, run off the rails in the 1870s um, and, and um, has, has, endorsed a has endorsed a position that actually might have gotten this result in another way. I mean, he, he, he thinks that the court was wrong to um, effectively effectively erase most of the approaches of immunity clause from the Fourth Amendment. And, and there are historical reasons why a right to marry might actually fit as a program of citizenship in a way that, that it doesn't fit as neatly in the community process. Um, you know, and I think there are things in, in, in the dissents that are worth thinking about. I mean, Justice Alito, for example, talks about the idea that, that historically, marriage became something that the state recognized because of a particular notion of what marriage was about. That is, the marriage became something that wasn't just between you and your partner and whatever church or, or faith tradition you, you were part of or your community, but became something the state was involved in for particular reasons. And that, um, you know, I think it is worth thinking about how today you can talk to people about what marriage means, what's it about, why you get married. The answers you get are very different than what you would have gotten 150, 200 years ago. And I think that's worth thinking about. And I think we're thinking about insofar as we're, we've gone through that change or are still in the process of going through that change, to what extent um, should that change be driven by legislative processes versus judicial processes? And I think that's, that's, you know, that's like one of these big omnipresent questions in the constitutional law that's always there, whether we're talking about this or anything else where, where norms change the society. Um, Chief Justice Roberts' dissent, I think, is, is overdone. I mean, he is at pains to distinguish between, to, to make clear that, that he has complaints about the role of the court and not about, and is not necessarily complaining about the policy judgment. Um, but I, you know, I think, um, I think, especially the, the indication of Lochner and saying, oh, this is this is a return to Lochner era, and that's so terrible. It's really overdone. I think it's 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 uncharacteristic. It's an uncharacteristic style of opinion for him. Um, he's usually more careful. Um, Scalia's dissenting opinion was um, remarkably restrained for Justice Scalia. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, Justice Scalia, particularly. <laughs> Involving uh, sexual orientation has been, um, you know, his rhetoric has certainly been revved up. Uh, and not here, um, which, which is interesting. I don't know if that's because um, uh, he's not, I, I don't know what it is. But it is, it is really, uh, but, it, but the, the overall tone that in the past, he took in, in cases like Lawrence and in the case of Lone versus Evans, um, uh, which invalidated the state initiative that had um, avoided uh, global and <coughs> um, uh, you know, there's, there's there's all this language about how the court is is capitulated to the opinion, you know, um, you know, doing what's fashionable, and, and there's really relatively little of that in, in, in his in his dissent, which as someone that reads you know, virtually everything the court publishes, it's very striking. Um, you know, and generally, you know, I think, you know, when the opinion comes out, you know, you need something to care about. You want to read all, all the individuals. Um, whatever one thinks of their individual judgments, we have a remarkably capable, remarkably intelligent set of this. Um, and, um, you know, it's rare that their opinion don't, even when it's rude, they don't give us something to think about. It. So, you know, um, I, I think reading opinions that, that are well argued, that with which I disagree, are, you know, it's incredibly valuable. Any question? Um, I wonder what your assertion is about the ability of same sex people to raise children. Because it seems to me, that it's much more difficult for same-sex people, uh, statistically, to raise children than it is for opposite sex well, couples to do it. Uh, and uh, be because people worry about being out of the state of the in court cases, and because 
when I've seen same-sex couples adopting or taking foster children, it, it has seemed to me that they're having to go through more hoops than other people do. Uh, and, and it has seemed to me that this decision will lay groundwork so that more kids get into homes. Uh, I think that's right. So I'm puzzled by what you're asserting. Okay, so, so a couple things. One is, and for, for a lot of the, the, the reasons you just raised, our empirical data on outcomes is virtually non existent. And there are a bunch of studies, but methodologically, yeah, um, yeah, methodologically, methodologically, they're terrible basically because there haven't been any US jurisdictions in, that, in which same sex marriage has been legal long enough to actually look at what happens when an out gay couple raises a child legally under the law, what happens to pregnancy. So, so you get all these studies that try and find proxies for that, and, and there are less. So there are a bunch of studies that have really small sample sizes, or they're trying to get the investigator, and there's one study where, very controversial study, where the guy tries to use the survey of whether or not a parent ever had had any sort of same sex sexual activity oh. as, the, as, the, as the proxy. And so, the studies, so, so all our studies about outcomes are mixed. Uh, um, we have good data on stable marriage, divorce, single parent. We have pretty good data that shows if you can hold everything else constant. And of course, in the real world, you often can't. Right? In the real world, you're, you're rarely choosing between perfect common and something else, right? You're, um, but we, we, we know from that data that there's a lot of reason to believe that two parents are better than one, that, um, that, that uh, 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 a child being raised in, in the house with both a lot of parents on average tend to have better outcomes than foster parents, step parents, adoption, and so on. Um, uh, and, and you know, we don't necessarily entirely understand all of what that is, but, um, but certainly part of the reason is, I think, that, that um, Child, raising a child is a lot of work, and having being able to share that burden um, makes it easier and increases the likelihood of positive outcomes. Now, that burden can be shared in, in, in various ways. But marriage is certainly one way to do that, and it's one way to bond two people to each other as well as two children. Um, so I think that for that reason, we have every reason to expect, based on the empirical data we have, which again is limited, that. Raising a child in a same-sex household with two committed parents of whatever sex will it is likely to produce better outcomes than one of those parents having to raise the children by themselves, than foster care, and so on. Um, and certainly, everything that the people that argue for traditional opposite-sex marriage as the gold standard would say are the reasons for better outcomes would suggest also that a same-sex couple is going to produce better outcomes on average, or any other thing that's equal, which again, we can't always do, than single parents, than, than other available parents. Um, the other thing is just the reality. The data are such that, that um, you know, what everyone thinks should be the case, right? hundreds of thousands of children right now are being raised in, 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 in homes with, uh, with gay parents, um, sometimes married, sometimes not. Sometimes a single parent, sometimes a parent that may have led the adoption agency to believe was a single parent, and in fact there was a committed partner, even if not very nice. I mean, you're certainly correct that in a lot of states it can be more difficult um, uh, and has historically been more difficult. Um, and, you know, in a lot of states, family law remains very archaic. Um, and, and, and anything other than kind of a cookie cutter conception of what home should be like faces all sorts of hurdles. Um, in my own case, um, you know, I adopted uh, my, my wife's daughter after we got married. Um, we had to, in the state of Ohio, go through the same process as if I, I was adopting from foster care. So we had to have a social worker come to our house and ask questions like, well, where, where will she sleep? And then, in her bedroom. Where is her stuff? In her bedroom or something. You know, it, it, it's just, you know, and, and so certainly that structure has, has made it harder for us. But despite that, right, hundreds of thousands of children we raised in, in households um, with, with gay parents, many of those uh, were open to adoption. Um, and again, whatever one thinks about whether or not being raised by two biological parents would or would not produce better outcomes, you know, we know what the outcomes are. 
traditional foster care. It's not what most foster parents have people, it's just it's a difficult situation. The idea that someone that's committed to raise a child for all of that child's childhood um, is not going to be preferable. I find that I find that to be there's nothing we know about child rearing that would suggest it's better to have fewer children around. And so those are, those are the points I'm making, that, that even if one adopts very kind of conservative assumptions about what the best situation for child rearing is, it's hard to argue that reducing the number of two-parent households is better for children. And like it or not, there are children that are going to be raised in gay households, and if you care about those children, you want those households to be as stable, as structured, and as, as secure as possible. And those are, to me, incredibly powerful arguments for recognizing same-sex marriage, Basing on the interests of the children, which is the, usually the argument made against this that, that marriage shouldn't be about the children, but should be about children. So, one more question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on Kim Davis and the legality of what she was trying to do right now. Yeah, I've written a lot about that. Um, uh, the short answer is Kim Davis should find a new job, and Justice Scalia agrees. So, um, so I'll give you the, the, the less flip slightly more involved in So Q Davis is an elected official. Um, she was elected, you know, she ran for was elected to do a certain job, and one of those was to issue marriage licenses uh, under state law. Um, and um, she also ran for office knowing that her virtual was on the horizon. I mean, she, it's not like she was doing this job for 30 years and suddenly you know, woke up one day and said, well, sir. Um, you know, if you can't perform a public function, then you shouldn't hold a public position. Uh, I say Justice Scalia agrees, because Justice Scalia wrote a, uh, what was at the time of the controversial essay, but one that was exactly absolutely correct, in the um, mid-90s, about the question of the death penalty and um, uh, what happens if the judge has religious or other principal objections to the death penalty. And in that, article, in that, in that um, uh, essay, he argued that um, certainly as a justice, where he has to be, you know, he get to get on the phone at midnight or whatever time, you know, when, when the, the, the prison calls out about, about whether or not there's going to be a stay. Um, but he is, like or not, as a justice part of machine to death. And if he felt that he could not participate in that, he, argued he, had, he would be obligated to resign because he could not uphold his solemn oath that he took to be a judge. If he could not fulfill all the things that are expected, and I, I think that that applies quite readily to this. Now, in terms of you know, civil service government employees, certainly there are many state laws, and federal laws that provide for religious accommodation. Um, they don't apply to elected officials; they apply to civil service. They, they apply to people that you know, co deputies, perhaps. Uh, but even in those cases, the rules typically are that you're, you may be entitled to religious accommodation so long as it does not result in denial of, of the benefit to, to those who are entitled to it. So um, the state of North Carolina, I believe, in, in anticipation of the court fell, passed a law saying that county clerks could decline to issue a, 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 a marriage license to a same-sex couple, provided there was someone else in the same office who would be willing to issue the license. I know, so, so if the person seeking the license, there is no difference. The same document will issue from the same office, and the, the person that has the latest objection gets their cops to help. Um, and that's a fairly traditional way to deal with those accommodations. Uh, you know, not only is it not you know, like official steps, those sorts of accommodations typically don't apply, certainly the federal law they don't. Um, she actually denied and refused to allow that accommodation. Right? Her accommodation was not I will let one of my deputies issue the license. Her, her suggested accommodation was drive 30 miles to the next town. And, and that's clearly, you know, there's no basis in, 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 the, in the history of, of, of religious accommodation laws that we have in this country or anything else to say that that's an acceptable way uh, uh, to deal with it. She takes an oath as a public official. And you know, she may think the Supreme Court's wrong, but you know, it's, it's right because it's fine, not fine because it's always right. I mean, it, it, she knows that the case, you know, she is what the court has concluded, and in her particular case, uh, after a vote, a lower federal, the governor of the state of Kentucky ordered all county clerks to issue same sex, uh, issue marriage licenses to same sex couples on the same terms as opposite sex couples, and 
a federal district court. She was sued a couple that wanted to get married in her county. And a federal district court issued an order. So what she was ultimately jailed for was not some abstract disagreement with same-sex marriage. She was jailed for being in contempt of court, for refusing to abide by a valid order issued by a court that had jurisdiction. And that's, that's open and shut. Um, and so, you know, um, and I think, I think even most people, most people that aren't running for office that kind of understand the law in this area kind of realize that, that, that the position she took was was a bit extreme and obstinate in terms of what she couldn't be uh, uh, entitled to. I mean, you know, that, that's not, there really isn't a tradition of providing that sort of accommodation. Well, thank you very much.